Today's sermon is called Common Ground. Now, when you think of the word common ground, what does it come, what comes to mind? When I look around the room, what do we all have in common? Now, I can say some things that I've been through, and let's see if it lands on your plate that we have something in common. Yep. My, my mom and my dad were the age of 17 when they first had me. My parents, um, I have four siblings, or three siblings, including myself. I love playing basketball. I love playing a lot of different sports. Um, what else? Uh, what else do we have in common? I'm a believer of God. I, I, I have a relationship with Jesus Christ, even though I wrestle with that from time to time. But I do have a, a relationship with Christ. Uh, I'm married. I have two kids. Uh, what else? Mm. Oh, yes, I'm a uni student as well, for those in uni. I'm studying uni, um, learning different languages like Greek and Hebrew, which is, yeah, it's quite funny because I also speak Samoan as well. So, <sighs> uh, what else? I live on the Central Coast, I live in Erina. Lives in Erina? Yo, yo. Um, why is it important for us to establish common ground? We're going to look at two characters today. A character named Paul and a character named Jesus. And we're going to highlight different things that they did to establish common ground for the greater good of getting each and every one of you to understand the picture of grace. Now, there's one common ground I wanted to mention, but I'll mention it now. When I first met Lee, the common ground that we have is that we have tattoos, <laughs> right? And uh, I remember when I first met him and we continuously did Bible studies, he said the most comforting thing for him was to know the guy up here that was speaking had a tattoo, which made him feel very welcome. And when you think of common grounds, you look at each other, you're like, I don't have anything in common with you. I don't have. But if you really listen to one another, we actually all have something in common. And each of us here have come today for a common purpose. So as we explore these two characters, we're going to unfold what Paul was trying to say and also what Jesus did while he was on earth. In 1 Corinthians 9, verse 20, it says, To the Jews, I become like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law, I become like under the law, though I myself am no longer under the law, as to win those under the law. Paul here was wrestling with different issues throughout the book of Corinthians. And each issue he wanted to address with different issues individuals in the community. And here he was established in the fact that he wanted to make sure he caught this, <laughs> broke down the barriers to establish common ground, right? So to the Jews, he was a Jew. Now, he was a Roman citizen, so he was entitled to many things being a Roman citizen. But here Paul was saying to the Jew, I'll be a Jew. So he basically... He, he followed what they ate. He followed their laws from time to, you know, in order for the ultimate goal, which we'll find in verse 23, to bring salvation to the individual. And here, Paul was talking about, I will be a Jew to the Jew. So then I will win some, maybe all, to the kingdom of God. In verse 21, he continues to say, to those not having the law, I've become like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. As to win those not having the law. Again, Paul here was just talking about, okay, Gentile was a word that was used um, to describe those who didn't follow Jewish traditions. And so Paul was addressing this in regards to the law. Now, in Samoan, there's a word that we use, and we don't use Gentile, but we say balangi, right? 
Now, it can be interpreted in different contexts, but I'm going to tell you what it actually interpreted as, because I got a big smack on the face from my parents because I misinterpreted the word. So, palangi, some people will call it um, Western, Western folk, those who grew up in Western society. But palangi actually means you are a foreigner to the land and the customs. So for me, like as you can see, I have nice brown skin. I'm actually a foreigner to my own country in Samoa because I grew up in Western culture. So here, Paul, we go back to it, Paul was trying to get as many people as he could because his ultimate goal was to draw people to the grace of God. He didn't lose sight of his goal, but he was able to make sure he didn't have anything standing in the way to create common ground with the, with the person next to him. In verse 22, it says, To the weak I become the weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that all people, all possible means I might save some. So weak doesn't mean you can't lift this. Um, it doesn't mean strength or weakness. It just meant that, you know, the, it, your, your thought process of how you understand the character of God and the laws and the things associated to the culture of the time. And so Paul was able to, again, he was a Roman citizen, so he sat on top, right? And he was entitled to a lot of things. But he didn't want that to be the hindrance for him to be, create this common ground with each different person in the community. In verse 23, as I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share there's another version that says, I may partake, which means this partnership in blessing. So he did all these things, so then he was able to create common ground. He became a Jew to the Jew, became a Gentile to the Gentile, became under the law with those who did not know the law. I know my brother-in-law is not here. He's in Tasmania with my wife and my son. And as he was growing up, he said to me, I continue, I, every time I speak to different types of people, because I know a few people, I, know, I don't know too many, Jared, I only know a few people, but every time I speak to, um, I'll say Islanders or Polynesians, I, I use a lot of like, uh, hey bro, what's going on? Like my, my words start to like slang a little bit. And uh, when I speak to Aussies, Go, hey, you going, mate? Yeah, what's doing? We're going to the survey today, and then, and then when I go and, and try and speak to those at uh, at university and stuff, the conversation changes again, right? Because we're trying to find. I'm trying to find this common ground. Throughout this year, I um, I took a couple of year eight boys, and uh, we do a lot of weights and uh, to pump our testosterone, um, and one of those things was trying to create a common ground with these young fellas. Now, at year eight, they think they can take on a 36-year-old man, which is quite funny. So there's always this reminder of being humble when uh, my pride starts to kick in from time to time, you know, with these young bucks coming around. Particularly, we had a three-on-three -three basketball comp. Um, and I, and I, you know, I, I have this competitive edge, and uh, I, I, don't, I don't like losing. For those who's, who's uh, I've played tennis with a couple of times on Friday, I'm pretty, I'm pretty much the loudest one there, right? And, uh, but I'm really competitive. And, and here Paul was trying to describe, basically, like I want to be, my goal is to bring people to know and understand the character of God. That's the goal. He never lost focus of his goal. And so whatever he needed to do, he didn't lose sight. So therefore, he didn't, he didn't transform to what the world's pattern had to do, but he needed to, to try and break down barriers to create common ground with one another. Our second character, 
Oh, so small. It looked big when I was looking at the screen. So I do apologize. But how did Jesus build trust in community? Because that's basically what common ground does. Common ground builds trust. And when you build trust, you build relationships. And when you build relationships, you build community. Jesus, in Mark chapter 2, he ate with people. Now, how many of you guys love food? You guys all know, most of you know that I love food, as you can see from sideboards. Um, I love eating. And Jesus loved eating with people. Because at the table, or at the seat at the table, he knew barriers broke down because we weren't talking about, oh, what do you do with yourself? Oh, where did you go? It's like, I'm going to get that piece of food before you get that piece of food, and I'm going to get that watermelon before you get that watermelon. It's all about the discussion of food. Breaks down barriers. Jesus did that. He ate with people. He put the needs of others in front of himself. Now, as a parent... The self-sacrifices that we have to make for our kids, oh, mate, sometimes we just want them to mm, follow suit. At the end of the day, we fold, and as a dad, I fold the most when it comes to my eldest child being the girl. But Jesus here, in Luke chapter 9, he just lost his cousin. And there was a crowd that followed him, a multitude of crowd. He wanted to go up and pray and probably cry. But instead, he put the needs of others in front of himself so he could build this common ground. He fed people uh, as a Samoan. I'm not, I don't cook. Trust me, I need to cook migraine noodles. I think that's as far as I go. Um, but he fed people. And when you have, the other week we had the appreciation lunch for our church, for our church family, where we, sh- we were around food. And we fed each other, not only with words, but with physical food. And that was so nourishing. Jesus did the same thing. He fed 5,000, fed 4,000, ah, fed heaps of people. He found this common ground. He healed people. Now throughout scripture, you see the physical healing that Jesus did. To, to bridge the gap, to form this common ground. Not only did he do physical healing, he did spiritual and emotional healing as well. So he was reaching the needs of the community in order to create common ground. He was a great storyteller. He wouldn't tell you direct truth because sometimes you couldn't handle it, so he'd tell it in parables. And he was a great storyteller. Even the children... We're attracted to him. He listened. In John chapter 4, a woman at the well, Jesus listened. And I think that's the most important element for us to grow and building trust in our community is listening, sit and listen. He also liked playing hide and seek. I chucked that in there because my daughter likes playing hide and seek. Um, and he did. In Luke chapter 15, he talks about parables of the lost sheep the lost coin, and the prodigal son. That he will continue to seek. As much as you think you're hiding, he will find you. If you let him find you. I know when I play hide and seek with my daughter, I go, go hide. I count to, she goes, count to 10, and then she stops me at five and says, come find me. And then I go looking for her and she's screaming and I go, well, I know where you are now. So the game's really over by that time. Um, but she gets excited anyway, so I just, just in a maze, I just, yay, we found you. And I know the Cosmo boys, they do a fantastic job when they go play hide and seek with uh, Tim Inner from time to time. But Jesus loved playing hide and seek because he continuously wanted to come and seek and save the lost. There's so many things that Jesus did to build trust. The last one I have on there is he led from the front. Jesus demonstrated what it was going to be like to lead. And in order to lead, you needed to serve one another. You needed to humble yourself. You needed to break down that barrier, suppress that vulnerability, and share and serve one another. 
And he did that. He led from the front. As you guys know, some of you may know, um, I, I do, I have another occupation, um, and it's in business. And it's always interesting when you identify a boss or a manager to a leader. Right? And in the world of business, you've got to try and balance your hat. And I struggle because this week I had to let go of a few staff members, which was very challenging. And I always pray and pray and also do make sure there's the processes are followed before anything can be executed. But I always wrestle with the fact that how can I continue to display grace in a business society? Because it's a challenging experience. And here Jesus, leaning back to Jesus, he led from the front. Everything he said, come, watch me, follow me, and you will see how to do this. Throughout scripture or throughout Bible, he said, watch, come, let's go. I'll show you. So here we have two characters, Paul and Jesus, displaying the attributes of how to reach our community. How funny that today's lesson is how to reach the unchurched, how to reach the unreached, and takes us in Acts chapter 17. Again, it's all about, so what are we doing? Our final one is, what do we, what do you need to do to show our community that Jesus wants a relationship with them today? As I was saying earlier, um, I was saying to Andrew, Pastor Andrew this morning, I said, oh, I love the air conditioning because that's all something we have in common. We feel the heat, yeah? I definitely feel the heat. Oh, I, yeah, that's why we're big close so you don't see the sweat. Um, but I was saying to Pastor Andrew, man, it's so good to have air conditioning, which means that we can preach longer, <laughs> right, and go past particular times so then, yeah, we're pretty cool, so, right? I wanted to leave you with that question. Family, community, the SDA church here, what are we doing to show our community that Jesus wants a relationship with them today? We have a booklet, a community booklet that goes out to try and reach our community. And I know particular groups, particular people do their thing in the community and we are so forever grateful and as Paul was saying, I am a Jew to the Jew. I'm a Gentile to the Gentile. I am who I need to be in order for, my, for the goal that I've set myself. And that is to bring people closer to God.